Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, we're really excited. Um, I'm, I'm Kristen Sofer. I'm with Lawrence Public Library. I'm the events coordinator here, and we're just so happy to partner with the Willow Domestic Violence Center and the Raven Bookstore to bring this event to you all. Um, this event, uh, we called it into our Big Read, Read Across Lawrence events that are surrounding the Urge the Roundhouse. Intimate partner violence and how it affects entire communities and even generations is at the center of that book. Intimate partner violence is truly a public health issue, and we're honored to have this event tonight. We are able to present our program with a generous grant from the EMA Big Read, which is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts designed to broaden our understanding of our world, our communities, and ourselves through the joy of sharing a good book. The EA presents EA Big Read in partnership with Arts Midwest. So please um, do buy a copy of the book from the Raven. There's a green button in the center of your screen and that'll take you right to Rachel's page on the website. And you can buy it there. They will ship it to you. If you live in the area, you can also do safe curbside pickup at their store downtown. So please support a wonderful local bookstore as well as an amazing author. Um, another housekeeping note, if you have a question, um, there's a little ask a question button at the bottom here. So just um, pop your question in there and we'll answer those at the end, uh, towards the end of the talk. And now I want to introduce Megan Spooky. She has been with the Willow since 2015. She started there in volunteer services then donor development, and in 2017, she became the executive director. She worked in education and project management until she found her home in the social service and nonprofit sector, where she was in charge of fundraising at the Ballard Center. Megan enjoys being a mom for two kids, two dogs, one cat, and one chinchilla, and participating in whatever her community has to offer. She's grateful to be a Laurentian and a KU grad, and we are so lucky to have her as a community leader. Please welcome Megan Spooky. You're on me. Of course I am. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Um, I want to say a few words because October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so we're so excited to be able to do this in this particular month. Um, and, you know, as we enter, are almost completing the eighth month of COVID, um, it feels sort of like cognitive dis dissonance to talk about awareness at this point because we're all acutely aware that there are all kinds of struggles um, throughout our community. Um, but we do want to particularly make people aware that, of course, people are being disproportionately affected. There are certain pockets of our community that are disproportionately affected by COVID, and survivors of domestic violence is one of those groups. Um, we at the Willow are working really hard to assist, to mitigate and adjust our services to make the most significant possible impacts for the greatest number of folks who are in need. And so many people who have lost their jobs and are struggling financially and emotionally and are experiencing stresses of things like online school and lack of communication with friends and family and community um, outside their homes are, are really in need of our services. These stresses affect everyone but are particularly dangerous for people who are experiencing domestic violence because home under these circumstances becomes a pressure cooker and secrecy becomes the order of the day and there aren't the usual safety nets of you know, church and school and work and friends and social obligations um, that kind of help people through those kind of challenges normally. And there's no one really to see a bruise or to notice a difference in someone's life. Um, so we have to look at domestic violence as a community issue and not just um, a personal behind closed doors family issue. Um, it definitely dis disproportionately affects vulner vulnerable populations like survivors of color, LGBTQIA plus folks, um, people with disabilities, and more than half of women that are murdered 
in our country are murdered by a current or former partner. So that's pandemic stuff right there, as well as the, the uh, COVID. Domestic violence is not just a family crime, it's a public health issue. And tonight we look forward to exploring options for more public solutions. And that's why we're so honored to have Rachel Louise Snyder here tonight. Uh, she's the author of No Visible Bruises, and um, we want to begin to have that conversation about the public sphere of this in, in particular. Um, speaking with her tonight will be our Managing Director of Survivor Service, Jessica Beeson, and our Director of Community Services, Taylor Jones, and I'll let them take it from here. Thank you, Megan. My name is Jessica Beeson and I'm the Managing Director of Survivor Services. Been with the Willow for two years. Um, in my capacity as Managing Director, I oversee all of our direct service programs, which includes our emergency shelter, our transitional housing services, um, and all of our community services, which we have court advocacy, um, we do all sorts of healthy relationship groups. We have two rural counties, um, offices. So it's a lot. We do a lot of things in the community. We first read No Visible Bruises as part of the Willow Management Team Book Club, and it sparked some really great discussions about public health based solutions to the issue of domestic violence. At the shelter level, we work primarily with survivors that are having an immediate crisis, um, but what this book really did a great job of is looking beyond those individual incidents into the systemic diocese, which we've traditionally kept domestic violence as being seen as a family issue, kind of behind the doors. DV is under-discussed. It's overly tolerated and disregarded by all of us, considering how deeply it permeates our entire culture. So um, thank you for writing this book, and thank you for being here with us today. Awesome. And my name is Taylor Jones. I am the Director of Community Services at the Willow. Uh, so I oversee a majority of those community-based programs, being court services, services for folks receiving public benefits from DCS, um, and as well as our rural offices and trying to make sure that we have equitable services for our entire service area. Uh, I've been with the Willow since about 2015 so it's been a pleasure to see the journey and growth uh, for this agency so far um, and I'm really excited about tonight because we haven't really done um, one of these sorts of interviews uh, before um, since like the recent couple of years um, so in No Visible Bruises journalist Rachel Louise Snyder frames the urgent and immersive account of the scale of domestic violence in our country around key stories um, that upend the common myths that if things were bad enough, victims would just leave, that a violent person cannot become violent, that shelter is an adequate response, and most insidiously, that violence inside the home is a private matter, sealed from the public sphere and disconnected from other forms of violence. Through the stories of victims, perpetrators, law enforcement, and reform movements from across the country, Snyder explores the real roots of private violence, its far-reaching consequences for society, and what it will take to truly address it. Before we get started, I wanted to remind the audience that we will be taking talking about um, domestic violence um, and perhaps some other just um, very hard experiences with just trauma overall. So if anyone in the audience uh, needs anything from us, has any questions or needs um, some assistance, I am actually going to be putting our 24 hour um, assistance helpline number in the chat as well as our email and text line in case anyone um, just needs to access us in a different way. Um, so I'll be putting those in the chat. Um, and before we do that, I think we also wanted to just make a land um, recognition um, about our service area and just um, recognize the Ka, Osage, Kickapoo, and Ochete, Shikokoin tribes. Um, just wanted to recognize them tonight as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. 
truly an honor to meet you. I really enjoyed this book. Um, and thank you to the Lawrence Public Library for co-hosting with us as well. Yeah. So No Visible Bruises is the culmination of 10 years of research by you. And while we read it, there might be some folks in the audience who have not. So I guess to start off, can you give us an overview of how you came to write this book and what that journey was really like for you? Well, it's a journey that I'm still on. <laughs> I'm still writing about, I didn't think I would. This was my third book and you know, usually once you've written a book, you've kind of got, got it out of you. Like you're ready to move on to another topic, but no, I'm still writing about the rest of the planet. So, um, you know, I came to it after nearly two decades of doing human rights stories around the world. A lot of stories that had to do with gender inequalities, you know, tribes and all, like things around um, a woman not controlling her own body, essentially. And um, domestic violence was in the back of all of those stories. Like, I remember being in Kabul in 2002, and I was talking to the women in prison there, nearly all of whom had been imprisoned for what they called love crimes, um, where they refused to marry their brother-in-law after their husband was killed, or they didn't want to marry, you know, they loved somebody else, didn't want to marry the their family had, had found them. Um, and I didn't even ask about domestic violence. It was like, of course there's domestic violence, of course. Um, so it wasn't until I came back to America after being out in the world for years and years that I, I met a woman standing on the driveway of her brother, and she worked in a domestic violence agency in Massachusetts. And I, you know, I did that American thing of like, "Hello, I'm Rachel. What do you do? I do this." Like, you know, the classic American icebreaker. She said. Well, you know, we have this program we started where we try to predict violence homicide before it happens in order to prevent it. And I was like, you do what now? <laughs> you know, I, was, I was in maybe 2009, and this program has been running for maybe five years. And I just, I was like, how can you do that? She said, well, we now know what the 20 highest risk indicators are for domestic violence homicide. And, we wait them, and I I couldn't get enough. I was like, that seems undoable to me. That seems absolutely undoable. And if it is, if I'm wrong and it's doable, how is it that we are not doing this everywhere and hearing about this everywhere? Through the course of really many, many hours of conversation with her, because of course I didn't Grow after that day, I you know called her for the next few years. Um, I began to realize that I held so many myths about domestic violence. Right, that if things were bad enough, victims would just leave. That violent people don't ever want to not be violent. Um, that if you were in a domestic violence situation and it was kind of bad luck, you know you had shelter and you had police and those are good enough responses. And I didn't even realize that I had bought into all of those until she educated me, really. And um, the more I realized if someone like me who had like traveled around the world and had all those privileges and had education, if I could hold all these myths about the very common thing, then, then the story was being told adequately. So that was really the the germ of no visible bruises. The other side, I know this is a long answer, but I feel like it's so important. The other side of it is that every writer thinks that their book is never going to be read. I mean, it just comes with the territory of being a writer. We're like, nobody will care except my parents, you know? And but in my case, I was like, yeah, right. My parents are, are the only ones who are going to care. But also, there's 400 years of us not caring about it in this country. So I, I actually had evidence that people wouldn't care. And so when I wrote it, I thought, well, if I'm trying to write a book that I know at the outset people are going to be biased toward wanting to read, how can I write something that is so compelling that it transcends its topic in a way? And that's that's what I that's what I 
10 years. That's why I felt like that, that was my task and my goal. I was trying to unmute myself and I was already unmuted. Um, and I'm glad that you said that. Um, I don't think I really talked about my favorite parts of the book either, or why I was, um, why it was so important for me to read. I love how you were able to empower survivors in a different way. Um, for, and, and specifically because of the reasons that you already listed. Um, and it really shone light on just the ways that survivors are choreographers of their own safety and survival. Like it really is a skill to um, survive these things. But you also talk about the nuances and the complexities of, inter of intimate partner violence, right? And how there's so much more to it. Um, and so I love that you talk about the beginning towards the end of your book, um, being kind of where, what's all that rooted in um, and what does that mean for us next? So I love that. Um, I love the phrase choreographers of their own. Like that is so visual and it's a hundred percent right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the police, the court system, all these systems that we have are all like very event based. Like you commit a crime, you get arrested, you go to jail for that one crime, maybe, or maybe you don't, whatever. But for domestic violence victims, their their lives are narrative based, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're all these events and escalation and adding it all up and what does it mean? And um, I just I it's such a perfect way to think about it. Like they are dancing between mm -hmm. events, really. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Where all the solutions that we have or so many of them are based on like what is the problem right now in this moment, not what is the comprehensive problem. Yeah, yeah. No, that was awesome. Thank you for that. Um so I wanted to talk a bit about um I wanted to talk uh talk a bit about intersectionality and domestic violence kind of ask you about that a bit um, because this book um, focuses on the experience of um, some, a couple of uh, white heteronormative couples, right? So what experience did you have during your research of how intersectionality affects domestic violence as a public health issue? How do you, how do um, the experiences of marginalized communities differ when it comes to interacting with law enforcement courts, um, it's different uh, agencies like that? It's a great question. And it's, I struggled with it a little bit um, for a number of reasons. One, like one of the hardest things about writing about domestic violence just generally is, are you, are you compromising somebody's safety and in what ways? And so like, that's always, um, that's always kind of dictating with how you're able to move through worlds, right? And so as a white, you know, cis, cishet, that's what the kids say, right? Cishet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so cishet. Uh, as a white cishet, you know, middle-class woman, like those were easy places for me to traverse. But there's also a number of people in the book who don't fit that or whose identities are, are hidden. So, for example, and I give them, I give them, whenever I give a pseudonym, I gave them all very white, like, white sounding names. Like, there's, there's a man in the book, later in the book, in the second section, kills his whole family. I can, what did I name him? O'Hanlon, something like that. Patrick O'Hanlon, like a good Irish name. Not white. He's also not black. Um, because that's going to be everybody's next question, right? So they would make that assumption. But I gave him this incredibly white name in order to not like have that issue. But what I'm finding and what I have found is that, um, first of all, there's the thing like I can name the things the book doesn't do probably more better than anyone. And one of the things it doesn't do is talk a whole lot about exactly what you're asking about. Like, what are the differences in, in for example, um, uh, race or um, uh, Im immigrant status when one is thinking of calling law enforcement, right? 
maybe Native American women never call law enforcement, right? Or if they do, they go to their own sort of tribal councils. There's, by the way, excellent, excellent podcasts from the, um, oh, it's on my, it's on my Twitter page. I just tweeted it. Um, that has all of these like issues outlined in separate podcasts. It's a, it's a, a conference. It's a month long conference that's going on the crimes against women conference national crimes against women conference so if you're interested in, in sort of a more detailed view they're doing really excellent podcasts but, um so i won't go into for example the issues with native women i don't go into for example the issues with um black women there who who's who black male counterparts have their own sort of problematic relationship with law enforcement and often won't call the police, right? There's, there's why when we talk about, when I say like domestic violence is not just an issue if you're standing at the receiving end of the punch, it is exactly because of this, because we cannot talk about um, mass incarceration and, and prison reform without including domestic violence in that discussion. We cannot talk about police brutality without including domestic violence in that. You know, one of the most common things I find is that when that people talk about what we call the power and control wheel. You all at, at Willow, you know, know uh, the Willow Center know about the power and control wheel. For those listening, <laughs> created in the 80s by this amazing woman named Ellen Pence in Minnesota. To explain the dynamics of a relationship for, of abuse to abuse in any given uh, any, any given family. And that power and control wheel is probably the most used tool, whether it's an abuser intervention class or a domestic violence center, um, to explain the dynamics. And it's fine, it's a very useful tool. But the thing that we're hearing now, and I'm just hearing this really since it came out, is that the power of control wheel is very um, Eurocentric. It's very much about white women and white men, and that black women don't necessarily feel powerless when they're standing at the recent end of the punch, but they feel something different. They have different terminology around it. So I think these are all the places where the book, you know, I might have a couple of sentences about it, but like, it's limited. And I think, I, I actually really do think someone else needs to, to bring this up in, in another book. Like, I think this is part of furthering the conversation. There's a great journal called Signals that did a discussion with me and four other, they had four experts critique my book and then I respond to them. You have to have a little bit of a, you know, stiff upper lip, like, I feel like oh, we're all in this to like make the world better. So it's not about my ego, right? And so this was, a, this was a common thing that some of the experts talked about and loved it because I was like, what they did was give us a roadmap for where we can go next in the conversation, you know? I could just walk in, I'm sorry. I love them, no, it's great, thank I, you. We're talking. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the most, Compelling aspects of the book for me personally was your discussion about high risk and high lethality teams. Um, in fact, it even inspired our organization to work with our local police department, DA's office, to create a victim advocate role, which oh is God. just now launching and it's fantastic. Um, can you briefly describe for the audience what those terms really mean and then how do you feel about their effectiveness? in the communities that have embraced those models? Sure, so high risk teams, high lethality teams are, um, there's two programs that kind of came, that, 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 that developed um, right alongside each other and there was some overlap in personnel, but one was called the lethality assessment program or the LAP model, and that was out of Maryland. And then the other one was called the high risk teams um, model, HRT, uh, and that one was out of Massachusetts, and they both came in the, sort of the early off, and they, there's a lot of overlap. The LAP model was developed initially for police officers on the scene to be able to ask critical questions, like, oh, look at them right there, and kind of determine their dangerousness, and that was, that's, that's sort of where it was limited when it was first conceptualized. A lot of communities have expanded it and, 
and morph it to make it work for them, whether they're in a rural community or an urban community or whatever. The high risk teams did something a little more comprehensive. They included the lab model, um, but then they would, they would get together with um, whoever was involved in domestic violence in their community. And that could be anyone from certainly the domestic violence agencies and the police, but it could also be probation and parole, it could be batterers intervention, it could be a hospital emergency, um, ER, it could be the DA. Um, some, some communities even have clergy, which I think is great because a lot of times victims go to their, their clergy or they go to the TV agency, right? Um, there might be a child um, safety advocate there, just all kinds of whoever is involved in any given community, and they meet on average once a month, and they talk about their cases, and they use what's called the danger assessment to talk about their cases, and these are the, the 20 high-risk indicators that I mentioned before when I was standing on the driveway with my friend and learned about these risk indicators. And, you know, if you're out in the, in the, in the ear and the audience listening, you can find these, these danger assessment risk indicators as well. You just go to danger, I think it's dangerassessment.org. And they're weighted. So the first questions are the, the, the bigger kind of markers of lethality, um, strangulation and choking, uh, access um, or ownership of a gun, um, prior incidents of domestic violence. Those are the top three, I think. Um, but there's, there's 17 other ones. Danger assessment they do with the victim, and they meet and they talk about where the case is. Is there going to be a change in the case? Is there a custody hearing coming up? And then they make a plan to sort of form a safety net around that victim rather than putting him or her in a shelter. They try to keep them in their house. They might put a perpetrator on yes, pre trial or even post trial. Um, they might, you know, order a batter or two in a user intervention class and GPS. Um, in certain states, they might hold them pre-trial if that's allowed in a bail statute. So there's all kinds of different um, possibilities. They might change the locks. They might install security cameras. They might ask the police to do extra drive-bys. What I have seen is that this has been an absolute game changer across the country, across the jurisdictions that have successfully implemented these high-risk teams. In part, people are communicating, like you're now communicating with the police, right? Um, and, and people's lives are being saved. I mean, it, it's really an astounding movement. I think it's only gonna get stronger and stronger. They've, they, they're now all you know around the world, they're doing this, so. Awesome. Um, and actually what you were just saying towards the end of that answer kind of leads into the next one um, pretty nicely um, because we as an agency often um, communicate with um, the local um, intervention programs for those who batter um, or as some recognize them as batter's intervention programs. You mentioned them a lot in your books. So um, in your um what are your feelings on how BIP or batters intervention programs fit into the larger conversation about treating um, domestic violence as a public health crisis? Yeah, that's a good, I mean, that's, it's a big question because a lot of times in the, in the discussion of domestic violence, um, abusers are either left out of this discussion altogether or abuser intervention classes are sort of poo-pooed as ineffective. And I think um, I think that's a little bit unfair, actually. I mean, the, the, you know, part of the problem is we have no national umbrella that certifies them. So they're certified sort of state by state in this ad hoc way that we do in the US. Like in the UK, they have a national certifying body. They also, they also have a, a hotline for, for violent offenders who are have gone through programming and are about to be like they could, you know, like AA has a, has a hotline or we have a suicide prevention hotline, right? Mm -hmm. And so it feels a little unfair to me to to make all the assessments when we're trying to do this with one hand tied behind our back, right? So I think that um, I think that we do actually need to beef up prevention strategies a little bit more. We've done pretty good job of 
providing services beyond shelter to victims. You know, in the 70s and 80s, that was our answer to everything. Build shelters, build shelters. And now I think we have a much more nuanced approach, right? We have a lot of like legal representation for free. We have transitional housing. We have kids programming because we know that like, you know, the model of abuse that a child will get will have them grow into a victim or an offender if they themselves don't have intervention. We have all of this. We have not paid the same attention to prevention strategies. And I did a story uh, for the New Yorker that you can you can access. It just came out, I think, in June maybe or something. Um, about the intervention during COVID, like what happens when all of your offender accountability shuts down? You have no code operating. You have no probation and parole oversight anymore. You have no, you know. And one of the stunning things that they found is that when the classes, these abuse intervention classes, went Zoom, as we all exist now in this world of Zoom and online, they were no longer mandatory. You can't mandate that somebody has internet in their home, right? We found that eighty percent of participants still showed up. Eighty percent. It's a stunning number because it flies in the face of what we assume about somebody who is violent and how they use violence. Um, and I think that that needs to inform what we do in going forward. I think we need to figure out a little better what works, but as a social science, we see the best who knew. Like it really didn't proliferate until the nineties, which you know, you think about from the from the time that that slavery was outlawed in this country until the time we passed the civil rights movement, it was a hundred years. And have we by the way eradicated no. But like just the legislation was a hundred years. So when you think about abuser intervention being that young, I think actually we should make some pretty significant strides in our knowledge. We just haven't figured out the implementation yet. Great. Thank you. Um, no Visible Bruises was released in 2019. And since that time, the pandemic has changed the landscape of the country and really of public health. In our community, we know that calls to our hotline have increased um, as families have been stuck together, kind of what Megan was talking about. And at the same time, given the necessity for us to put pretty strict COVID protocols in place in our congregate living spaces, it has, we've really struggled to fulfill the increased need and to really address that. So in your ongoing research, what are some of the challenges or successes that you have learned about during this time from other DV centers across the country about how they're dealing yeah. with this issue? You know, unfortunately, um, I mean, I don't know if it's helpful to hear that you're not alone <laughs> in those challenges or not. It's like, we're all in this shithole together, you know? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I'm i hearing that um, e even in places where the calls, the hotline calls have stayed the same or even dropped off a little bit, the calls that have come are much more severe, much more severe. Um, you know, in the beginning, I would say the first four months of COVID, uh, none of our systems were working at all. I mean, even, even like victims didn't want to have their abuser potentially being taken to jail where they were going to get COVID. So they weren't calling or, or if they did call, police didn't want to walk into a home. So they weren't doing an investigation, which means prosecutors didn't have as much to work with. And, you know, so there's just, there's this kind of ripple effect everywhere. And I think the real challenge is, as you say, not just protocols within things like your shelter and your transitional housing. Like, how are you telling these kids in shelters that they can't interact with the only other kids who are in shelters because they're supposed to be in their own individual bubbles? I mean, a lot of um, shelters that I talked to had, had dipped into their budgets in ways that they couldn't really afford, but to buy like Chromebooks and stuff for kids because they, they, they needed something to, to, you know, they're like stuck in his rooms and stuff. I think we're figuring out how to live now a little, a little better. The real challenge is um, how do you reach people who are in these situations behind closed doors? I mean, what, what COVID is doing 
is perfectly, perfectly grooming the next generation of victims and abusers. Like, if I thought domestic violence and domestic violence important conversations in 2015, 16, 17, 18, like now it's it's off the charts in terms of how I feel it's really important. I did have an ER doc say to me a couple of months ago, you know, it's not the COVID cases that I'm going to remember in my ER. It's child abuse. Um, and I, th you know, I don't know that anyone has fully figured out a way to reach those people apart from if they are in your system, in other words, if they reach out, if they reach out to law enforcement or to the DV agency, that gives you an opening to say, you know, our new protocols now are that we call you once a week and we check in, right? So that way they're not responsible for it. So they're not like pissing off their abuser, right? They could say to their abuser, I don't know, they call all the time. It drives me nuts. I need some help here, right? Mm -hmm. As you get those dynamics. But I don't know that that anyone is um, has figured out how to how to reach the people who don't reach out to us first. I think it really depends on us reaching out in an individual way to our neighbors, like really, and I mean like literally our neighbors, all of us. You know, what this I would say is is batter batter or intervention. That's been that was so surprising to me when I when I heard that they were still having 80% partic participation. And in fact, one of the guys said to me, you know, it's so much easier for me to join from my house. My wife and I don't have to find babysitters. We don't have to, you know, like negotiate childcare. And when she sees me go into this room every Monday night into our bedroom, she says I come out a different man and she's more patient with me. And because I see that she's more patient with me, I'm more patient with her. Like that's amazing to me. That's a pretty, pretty big success story. Yeah, that's some beautiful work. Um, that's awesome. Uh, so Jessica, is this about the time we wanted to look at questions from the audience um, to kind of interrupt uh, us just bothering Rachel this whole time? Um. Yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding? Do we have any? Yes. Uh, to, I'd be like watching the British baking show. <laughs> Is that your go to these days? <laughs> you know, it, it's gotta be lighthearted. Yeah. My brother was just here for 10 days, my brother and sister in law, and like, I mean, they're both professors, they're like super smart people. And like every night I hear him down there, like listening to, to whatever season he's watching, re watching all the seasons, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jessica, were you able to find any? Well, so I'm I'm not really sure. I don't know if they would come up in this box, so maybe we don't have any. Um, and we can certainly keep asking yeah. questions. Yeah. So, so can, I, can I tell you an anecdote then from um, a, with that same that same program? The guy that I spoke to was um, ah. in a program in Milwaukee, an abuser intervention program in Milwaukee that I wish I would have known about before I wrote my book. I did not know about it, but it's called the Alma Center, A-L-M-A. -A. Yes. And um, it is fascinating what they do. Like they do different, something different than I've ever seen. And one of the things they do, I enjoyed this, this anecdote. One of the things they do is when someone to go to that, it's a 40 week um, abuser intervention program. They have to write down 10 reasons why they're a good candidate for that program. Mm -hmm. even though they're court ordered. And so I, I asked the question that you're all asking in your minds right now, which is why wouldn't they just write down because a stupid judge made me, because a stupid judge made me, because a stupid judge made me. And the woman who um, who started it, Terry Stradoff is her name. She said, oh yeah, yeah, we get them doing that. And then we call their probation officer and we say, they're not ready to join yet. Um, Take, take them, take them back. And they have to, they actually get rearrested and they spend like 48 hours in, you know, in a holding cell in jail. And she said, they're then invited to write those 10 reasons again. And inevitably she said, what happens is the first one is because my stupid wife called the cops on, you know, something that I didn't even do anything, you know? And then because my wife is mad at me, because my wife and I fight all the time, 
because my children don't like to spend time with me because my, and by the time they get to like number 10, they're like, because my life is not what I wanted it to be. Like they're like, they're recognizing that this could be something that is actually life changing for them. And the exercise is meant to put them a little bit in control because you know, the one thing about being in any of these systems is that they can very easily make the abuser victim relationship. I'm, you know, I'm a judge. I'm going to tell you what to do. I have power and control over you, right? You're mimicking that for an abuser who then mimics it for that his or her partner. This way, it puts them kind of in the driver's seat of their own fate, and they see then that this could help them. And the woman who started this program said that they come in the first week, like realizing already that like there's a change that needs to happen. And I thought I just thought that was so. I had never heard of another um, group doing that. I'd never heard of that in a curriculum, and I thought it was so. Um, simple and innovative. Yeah, I think it's great that you bring that up. I think a lot of times when we're in our support groups, a frequently asked question is, um, well, what if I just recommend them to go to this class? Or what if I recommend them from anger management? We have to talk down from anger management into that um, intervention program, right? And so once we get onto that uh, landscape of intervention programs, um, even then it's, okay, well, right, should I recommend them? And the answer has to always come from us as, well, they, even then, when it's recommended or court ordered or they want to go, um, they still have to show up as them. They still have to be ready to do the work. Um, so even if that is a piece that we write down in your safety plan and they say, yeah, I'm going to go, there still has to be some sort of shift for them to want to right, commit to that work um, and, and figure out what's that what's that thing that they're willing to um, dig down deep and, um, and explore. I'm also glad that you brought up that program because I did look it up after I saw one of your other interviews, they're offering some of those groups for free um, every week, every, um, right about now. So participants are able to just say, hey, I need the code and they give them the Zoom code and they can just drop in for free, which is so important. Um, so you can't even afford to go to the class. Um, probably not gonna go. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing is that like, you look at a model like AA, you know, when you get out of, well, you don't really ever get out of AA, but when you when you are sober, you have a sponsor and you have a place that you can go. And I'm like, why are we not doing that with, with people who go through these classes? Like, why do we not have sponsorship programs or like the Alma Center has these community programs. So you can just drop in and be like, man, it was effed up week, whatever, you know? Yeah. yeah. We did get a couple questions. Um, and so the first one is, in the book, you give a story of a woman who didn't want to leave her home and, just, mm -hmm. and, and flee to shelter. Mm -hmm. So have you done research on the notion of shelter for abusers so that the survivors are not the ones that have to leave? I know, okay, I say, <laughs> I say that every time I give a talk now. I love that. I'm like, we have this amazing shelter system across the country, 2,000 plus shelters that we have now. We also have a problem, a real problem of mass incarceration. How can we solve both these problems at the same time? Well, instead of arresting abusers, we can make them go to the shelter and keep the victims in their homes. And then they can like, like go to work during the day and come back it, it, you know, like a halfway house, they have a curfew of 6 p.m., 7 p.m., and then they come back and they learn gender education and they learn you know, household chores and they learn, you know, all the things that you learn in a user intervention class. And they do this. I've only ever heard of one program, but they, but they do this in Israel. And it's been running for like 20 years. And they have these guys go, and they're still able to then not only participate in the economic lifeblood of their family and their country and their community, but they're not cut off from their children. They can have visitation, supervised visitation with their children. They spend a minimum of four months. I think some spend more. Um, I was supposed to report on this and then COVID hit. So I haven't, able, I haven't seen the program up close and personal. I can't speak to its efficacy, but 
I mean, I think it's a creative, amazing mm -hmm. idea. Um, and then, and and then in the evenings they learn. They do group counseling, individual counseling, AA or NA, depending on their needs. Mm -hmm. um, and they also learn household uh, chores and childcare and cooking. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole like component. Mm -hmm. I think it's really innovative. You know, there's no other crime I can think of where we expect the impetus to be on the victim. To, to do the moving or to make the change. And I know that shelters are necessary, but man, they are they are disruptive. They are they are an inadequate answer. You're housing, you know, um, uh, traumatized families with other traumatized families, very often in one room. You know, the woman in my book, there's a couple of women that refused to go to shelter, but one of them in particular said, you know, her husband had convinced her that because he worked on installing cable TV, he knew all the shelters all over New England and he would find her. Mm -hmm. And she said, if I'm in a shelter with my two daughters, he'll kill all three of us. If I'm at home, he'll really kill me. And that is exactly what happened. And I can think of no better summation of sort of the problem with shelters. Even yeah. though I, I admit that they are necessary and that people work in them are really doing like holy work um you know they're not a great answer you know if you if you are taking care of sick parents you can't do that in a shelter if you have a job you know you can't take your kids out of school if you do you can't register them in another school it's not you know people can't just up and leave these days we right. live in bureaucracies that require paper trails and you know <laughs> like um, yeah. yeah. No, that's we have really another question. Um, it says, I am an MSW intern and women's advocate in Minneapolis, St. Paul. As you can guess, the relationship that our community have with police are very fragile and fraught in the way of George Floyd. What do you see as a way forward in facilitating these conversations and re engaging, prompting buy in both sides of the side? So I didn't, you're, you cut out a little bit on, I heard that there are Minneapolis and George Floyd, but I didn't get the, so, the, the question. Yeah, the main question is, what ideas do you have for moving forward and facilitating conversations, re-engaging both sides of this divide? I think, you know, kind of community and law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. You know, anecdotally, that thing about George Floyd, and I'll answer that question, but I, this is so important. I have a whole chapter on strangulation and traumatic brain injury and domestic violence, which we're woefully behind on in terms of identifying those things. And there's a huge knock on effect. We can lose custody of our children because they have undiagnosed TBI from repeated strangulations, for example. Um, but George Floyd, you know, there's four police around him, one of whom is strangling him, not strangling him, cutting off his airway. And George Floyd urinates on himself. And had any of those police officers, any of them, been trained on how to identify non-visual strangulation, they would have known that that is a sign that he's seconds away from death. Every police officer in this country should be trained on that because it is so dangerous for, it's one of the top three markers for lethality in domestic violence relationships. Um, I do think, you know, this is a really fraught topic and I, like I am, I am conflicted about it because there are times where it is just so dangerous. You don't want to send an advocate into that kind of situation, right? They're unarmed. Advocates don't walk around with, I don't know any advocates who walk around with guns. I mean, I guess maybe some do, but you know, they're not trained in that kind of stuff. At the same time, police are not trained in conflict management, right? Like they're just, they're, they're going to make a mandatory arrest or a mandatory report and move on to the next level. So I do think that, that um, we can do a lot more with intervention strategies where the advocates are sort of spearheading what they think is the most important thing. It, you know, I live in Washington, D.C., and one of the things we have here is called the response line. It's 24-7, and it's in the court, in our actual courthouse. I do write about this briefly in the book. Um, and the response line is for the police. 
when the police get a domestic violence call, they call the response the response line and say, this is who I have. And then the advocate looks up that person in their system. And, and if, the, if it's a high risk case that they know about, it'll be marked in the system. Yeah, that's a high risk case. Let's get, let's get, you know, the locks changed there. Let's get that person arrested, whatever. I think that's, a, that's the beginning of a really good system. It's not the end. Um, we also have advocates. We have, we try to have an advocate on every shift with the police driving around with them in a police car. I think that's a great idea. You know, in Montana now, where I wrote a lot of the book, um, there is now a dedicated domestic violence police officer who follows up with every single case in Billings, Montana, that the police get a call and then she follows up with it. Um, so I think because, you know, the fact is what police say is, they don't have time in the academy to really do more than like four hours of training on domestic violence. You know, it's crazy. I mean, they should all just like read my book. That would be, that would be like some training, <laughs> like really self-serving, but I, you know, um, you know, I, so I think, I think you've got to get advocates more involved. You've got to triage some of these cases from ones that are dangerous to ones that are, that are, maybe not the high lethality, right? They, they're they're not fun, but they're not highly lethal. And I think the people who do that are not the police. The people who do that are the advocates. Mm -hmm. um, I, like, I like some of the ideas that people have had around having, you know, social work psychologists, um, having, you know, like in Berkeley, or not, yeah, Berkeley, Oakland, California, they actually have like a mental health team that you can call if you, you know, it, if your assessment of any given situation on public, you know, that you're viewing as a, as a person in public, call the mental health hotline and, and, and they'll send somebody out in an ambulance rather than the police going out. And I think, I think we need to look at those kinds of things. The other thing is like community policing. I don't, I, it's, it's a little beyond the scope of my book, but it, it seemed like, when police officers were really truly part of their community and knew everyone in the community, it was a very different situation, right? It was a very different um, um, relationship that families had to their officers because they knew them. Yeah. Awesome. We have one more in the chat, at least that I can see. Um, asking, how do we help young juvenile offenders better understand DV? Um, and I feel like you've had some talks about this in terms of focusing on some sort of curriculum for younger folks. So I think that would be a good um, segment for this right here. Underneath it says house arrest. And so I'm, I'm just assuming they're trying to make connections between um, perhaps the punitive side of, of what juvenile offenders see um, and, and how they can be educated about um, domestic violence. Well, that's it's that's a huge problem right now, and I will tell you we're trying to um, we're trying I'm we're rewriting No Visible Bruises to be um, to have a version for youth right now. So awesome. because I nice. because I, that there's yeah I think there's a real dearth of information out there, and we um, when, you know like I I spoke in Texas before the before COVID hit, and they were telling me when I was there this is in Dallas right so like city, big city. And they were saying that the entire state, they're not allowed to teach sex education anymore for the most part. Like they're not, you know, it's an abstinence only curriculum. And so what that means is that they don't teach anything about dating violence, nothing, because it's considered sex education and it's just abstinence only. So you have states like I think Louisiana is another one, right? Where the, the, the restrictions on what is actually being taught are worse now than when I came of age in the 80s, right? I mean, who can remember? I can't remember what I was taught, if anything, about domestic violence. But like, you know, um, and I think at the same time, all of our, our popular culture, you know, the thing that drives me crazy is I look at these movies and I look at like the 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 Robert Pattinson character, you know, standing wow. over Christmas character Kristen Stewart's character in Twilight, watching her as she's sleeping. And it's it's this is couched as like big romantic gesture. And I'm like, it's 
he's stalking her. Like that's called stalking. Like it's not cute to bring a band play on some girl's lawn. Like it's creepy, right? I mean, you know, it's just weird. Um, that's a bad that's a bad example. But I I think, you know, so I think to me there are there are sort of big systemic problems, but then there's also just like this like we don't know how to talk about it and we don't know we haven't even figured out like what works necessarily. Now, what I'm what I'm hearing, there was a big study done in New York um, fairly recently in the past couple of years where they looked at what was effective for dating violence with teenagers. And one of the things that they discovered worked, seemed to work really well was restorative justice. And I can see in that setting because teen dating violence Usually, well, I can say usually not as lethal. It can be just as lethal, but it's it's very it very often starts as like just a super intense relationship and extreme jealousy, right? So it hasn't escalated in terms of violence and things like that yet. But if we if we can teach people that those signs are danger signs or red flags or warning signs, we not only are restoring power to the victim but we are giving an education to the person who is performing those acts of extreme jealousy or whatever, right? Because they are subject to this cultural information. So they're getting this information that says, this is what it means to be a man. Um, and so they have found that restorative justice is particularly effective. And also that like, like you're not shaming the perpetrator. I, I'm, re I'm reticent to call someone who's 15 a perpetrator, right? Like, like they're living in a kind of ignorance. But for the sake of conversation, I'll call them perpetrator. Um, but that if they have accountability, you know, like counseling for the victim, but also accountability for the perpetrator in a way that isn't shaming, that also is is a very effective strategy. And so this this um, report that looked at the school couple of schools, I think, in New York had kind of three points in any programming that you do, which is, you know, use restorative justice, have a no shame accountability system, mm -hmm. and then also have clear places for both parties to go get advice. By the mm -hmm. way, for anybody listening, um, the Yardley Love, many, many of you might know her. She was a young college student who was murdered by her um, lacrosse player boyfriend. Um, at the University of Virginia, maybe 10 years ago, five or 10 years ago. And her mother started the One Love Foundation, and it has excellent, excellent resources for young people. Fantastic resources, like a Q&A, mm -hmm. and also things like how to how to see if your technology is, is being compromised by somebody mm -hmm. like hack you or look in on what you're doing. It's, it really does great, great work. Mm -hmm. We have reached a time barrier. We were supposed to be done at eight, but we do have one more question. So I wanted to see if you had a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this question says, um, back on the topic of police officers, research suggests that family violence is two to four times higher in law enforcement community than it is in the general population. Um, and that they, and in fact, police might have a bigger DV problem than the regular population. What thoughts do you have on that? Or, you know, what what research have you looked into on that? A hundred percent that is that is accurate. I've read I've read that, you know, rates can be forty percent higher, not just the police but the military. And I would point you to two articles, both of them written by Melissa Jeltsin, J E L T. S E N Melissa Jelson at Huffington Post. She did one, um, I think it was called the Super Predators about DV and police, and she did another one about DV and the military. Fantastic articles, both of them. Um, yeah, I found rates um, of DV much higher in, and not only that rates of DV are higher, but the victims have no recourse they're t completely scared right then they don't think his buddies are going to arrest him in fact in my book i recount um a scene that is that uh, is on video um of like a, a a police officer who's been put on leave because he threatened his his estranged wife and her new boyfriend and strangled him and threatened him with a gun and stuff and then his buddies kind of take him and their camera is going and they're like dude come on man you know yeah hey let's just and they kind of laugh it off 
And like days later, he ends up killing her and her new boyfriend mm -hmm. and then himself. Um, you know, I think to me, this is a problem of leadership. It is a real problem. Um, there's a there's a training I sat in on in San Diego where they do um, hostage negotiations for police officers with uh, specifically in domestic violence situations. And most people don't realize this, but something like 80 percent of hostage situations in the U.S. are domestic violence situations. They're not like a bank robber with a whole cavalcade of hostages. Right. Like that's movies. Um, and what and the problem with not understanding that it's domestic violence is that someone who robs a bank has very different goals for getting out of there alive with or without that money than someone who is holding his family hostage, who probably doesn't care if any of them live or die, right? He just doesn't want to give up control of that situation. So it changes the dynamic. And one of the, on the very first day of the training, they talk about what happens if it's a buddy of yours? What happens if it's somebody that you know? And inevitably, everyone in the class is like, no difference, no difference. We, we'd pull him in too. We'd negotiate just the same. And I just, you know, I just sat there going, no, I don't believe that. I, you know, I want to believe it, but I don't believe it. It is a real problem. And I don't, I don't have the answer other than that if it is happening in, um, if it is being allowed in a police department, I think, it, I think it is a problem of leadership. I think it starts at the top and that's where the changes should be made. Should be made. Um, but it's another reason why I think that police reform is so, so important, right? You have that much thing that just is current running and representation matters too in police in police you know uh police often you know we need we need women we need minorities we need you know we need people of color we need foreigners um but that alone isn't going to change the nature of policing right thank you so much for that um and thanks for spending this time with us tonight not to put you on the spot i have noticed that at some events you do at least open with um, some sort of um, um, statement or um, just note that someone has sent sent you since the book has come out. We just wanted to offer you that space in case you. Oh. But again, you can um, do not have to do it. But I was asking her, like, did she say that she wanted to do it? Did she say? And oh. what? <laughs> No one said anything to me, but I do get so many messages. Um, let's see. I got, let's see. I get, I've gotten, let's see. I, 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 I am looking on my like, Twitter right now. Well, I've gotten some incredibly, I also have a big like stack right to my right of, you know, letters and things like that um give me one second just talk amongst yourselves yeah, no. <laughs> what i was going to explain to those who are watching um i think it's um what i've loved about um rachel's other talks is that she still very much stays centered centered and grounded in the fact that even right now, as we're having this conversation, this is happening for somebody else. Um, this is not something that we're kind of talking about as an overnight thing that has happened, um, um, you know, a long time ago. It's still just very much in the now. And so I just um, I just appreciate um, when you share that. I got one, I got one for you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Pretty recent. Thank you for no visible bruises. I wish I had the words to convey to you how deeply I feel heard. Even though my stepdad beat us girls and not our mom, the characteristics are identical. Your book is touching every sore spot in my psyche, and it's opening my eyes to how my mother was being brutalized through the violence he perpetrated on her daughters. And because you've opened my eyes to this way of seeing it, I'm finally able to see why she taught us to accept it and to survive it rather than protect us by removal. I'm feeling compassion for my mother where before I hated her for what I felt was betrayal. Oh, that's, thank that's you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
for letting us in on that. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and for spending this time with us, answering all these questions. Um, for those of you who are tuned in, please click on that button to buy this book. I can tell you from my personal experience, it is, it's a difficult read because it's emotional, but it is so well written and frankly, it's a page turner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so, so thank much. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hey. Thanks for everybody coming in.